Um, yeah, if you have your Bibles, um, turn them to Luke chapter 23. And, uh, you know, last week, uh, and uh, hey, let's also, let's all silence our cell phones. Just kidding. Everyone, uh, it just seems like that happens all the time, and it's usually my phone. It's in my wife's purse, and it goes off, or one of these things. Just make sure that your phones are silenced just right off the bat, so there's not one, like, right in the middle of service. Um, but also, too, last week, um, we talked about the weight of our sin. Oh, left something out. We need Bibles. Bibles, raise your hand. Why they're passing out Bibles, I'll tell you a funny little story. Uh, this morning, I lost, we all lost an hour of sleep, and this was the first time I've ever had to teach a, um, a Sunday morning that was a time change, and I don't know what happened, but at 7.30, if you guys were here, man, I don't know what was going on. I couldn't read. Like, I, was, I don't know if it was just early, and I just shouldn't be reading that early out loud, uh, but man, it was all over the place, and I just looked at them, and I was like... I'm really, really sorry that I'm sounding like I can't read right now, but I promise I can. But luckily, it all, it all turned around, and God did awesome. But, boy, it was, it was scary. I mean, that's early. Having a service at 6.30 a.m., basically. My daughter was up all night, so I didn't get any sleep. I'm just, now I'm just up here rambling, but that's okay. I can do that too. It's no big deal. Uh, but yeah, so we've been going through the book of Luke, and, and it seems like um, we were, have been going through the crucifixion of Jesus or the beatings of Jesus for a while, and now we are in the resurrection of Jesus, the most important part. And also as well, we're not going to just be in there one week. We're going to be in there a few weeks because if I'm going to spend that much time in the part of him getting, you know, beaten and crucified, I think there should be just as much time of him being raised from the dead and uh, us celebrating in that victory. But last week we talked about the weight of sin. And you can go ahead and open that door up now, Michael. We can close it again. It's no big deal. Uh, But yeah, so we talked about the weight of our sin and how Jesus willingly went to the cross for us. We know that Jesus is the only person that could pay that debt for us. Amen? Our own self-righteousness, anything that we do, could never match up to what Jesus had to do for us. He is the perfect, he is a perfect and spotless lamb. He's the only person that our sins could be completely taken away for us. The only person person that's perfect is God, so God himself had to come and die for our sins. And we know that as he was crucified there, that it said the sun was darkened, the rocks split, the earth quaked, and the veil was ripped from top to bottom. Man, it showed us that just, it, just through Jesus Christ, uh, you know, that w- we have that relationship with the Father. When that veil was ripped from top to bottom, it showed that we all can walk boldly into the Holy of Holies. No priest, no anything. Now it's us with the communication of the Father through Jesus Christ. Amen? We now officially have that because Jesus died for us. And I think about it. I think about the people that were sitting there as Jesus was being crucified, and a lot of those people had seen a lot of people crucified in their time. And to sit there, and when Jesus was crucified, this person that called himself the Son of God, and people began to talk about it, and the minute they, they, they crucified him, the sun was darkened. This was something that was recorded throughout history from Roman scholars as well as all these other Roman historians. The rock split, there was a gigantic earthquake, and this giant veil uh, was ripped from top to bottom. I don't know about you guys, but if I had, you know, if I physically had a part to do in crucifying, all of our sins had a part to do in crucifying our Lord, but if I was physically one of the soldiers that was crucifying Jesus, I think I'd be scared to death at that point, right? Up until that point, you're like, oh, maybe he's not. But the minute you crucify him, you've crucified lots of people before, and everything starts going crazy. A lot of crazy stuff started happening. And uh, so we know that shortly after, when Jesus was on there, he began to pray that God would forgive them, for they know not what they do. Remember, he's on the, he's on the cross. He says, Father, forgive them. What an amazing prayer that he had. A heart for people. And it's the same exact way. That as soon as he was to be crucified, all that stuff was going to be happen. He, he gave his father into your hands. I commend my spirit. As soon as Jesus died, people who had their part in crucify him, crucifying him became... Um, just started getting saved. We know that one of the, the, the centurion that was sitting there, he was sitting there, and basically at that point, he uh, began to glorify the Lord and said, Surely this was the Son of God. And that's some of the other priests and some of the other people that had a part in, in crucifying our Lord began to give their hearts to the Lord in the way that Jesus asked and, and said, Lord, please forgive them. God began to forgive them through Jesus Christ right as they gave their hearts, right as Jesus died. 
There was that, that veil that was ripped from just wide open that these people, these, these Roman guards and all these other people could go through. And tonight, I'm happy to tell you that Jesus didn't remain dead. Tonight, we're talking about the resurrection, a wonderful, wonderful time for us. Because if Jesus would have stayed dead, we would, have still, we would still just be dead. I mean, we'd have nothing. But Jesus conquered sin. He died so that we might live. We're going to read all about that tonight, so I don't want to have the big spoiler alert because it's coming at the end. But, you know, um, I, so I'm happy to show you the resurrection of Jesus. I have a quick little video to show you that's a good time to get started. Through 2412, it says, But all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good man and a just man. He had not consented to their decision. Indeed, he was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who he, who he himself um, was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it uh, in a tomb that was hone out of the rock. There uh, were, uh, sorry, where no one has ever lain before. That day, was the, uh, that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. And the woman who had come with him from Galilee followed after. And they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils. And they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and, a certain, and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And they went in, and they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that the, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their heads to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember what he, how he spoke to you when he was in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, and they returned from the tomb. And told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told them these things to the apostles. And their words seemed like like idle tales, and they did not believe them. And um, that's where we're going to leave off there. We're not going to go into 12. So let's go ahead and pray. (laughs) Dear Lord, we just love you, and we thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you that you gathered us here, Lord God. And Lord, as, um, as it's nighttime, Lord, that, that a lot of us have already been to a, um, one service this morning. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that there's people, Lord, that just want more and more and more of you. And so, Lord, I pray as they show up and they want more of you, Lord God, that you would be faithful to them and just be amazing right now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for Sunday night service, and we thank you for um, just, just kind of the vision that we've had, Lord God, and the different things that you have shown us. And Lord, we just pray that right now you would just be at the center of our service. Lord God, you would just receive our worship, Lord, that we could focus on you and that we could grow in you. And Lord, it would just be a beautiful thing in your sight. And we love you and thank you in Jesus name. Amen. Also too, before we get fully started, I want to announce one more thing. March 29th, we're going to do something here and I want you guys to come. I want you guys to invite people, but um, I know we haven't been doing the engaged dinners. So what we're going to do March 29th is Grumpy is coming and we are barbecuing hot dogs and hamburgers and it's going to be uh, right at about six o'clock or so. We're going to be barbecuing. We're going to have tables and chairs and everything outside. And it's for everybody. It's going to be right when our service starts at six o'clock. And uh, basically we're going to eat. We're going to hang out. We're going to pray. We're going to come in. We're going to have worship and communion and a short message and uh, just have a time of fellowship. And afterwards we're going to have s'mores and some other things. And so um, we, we could, you guys can bring side dishes. It doesn't matter. You know, the hot dogs and the hamburgers are taken care of, but I want to encourage you guys, March 29th, write that down. It's going to be a time of just, uh, um, worship fellowship. Um, uh, we're going to have worship in here and we're gonna have a microphone right here down on the floor and just have you guys have a chance. If someone wants to come up and say something, uh, something the Lord has laid on their heart while we worship, or there's just a word of encouragement or there's something that you have for us, we want to hear it. And so we're going to have a microphone down here and it's just gonna be a time of all of us working together as believers, all of us, um, just, uh, just sharpening one another and having that chance to get to know each other a little bit better. So that's March 29th. Write that down in your calendar. So anyways, let's go through uh, 49 through 53 right now. It says, but all of his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and just man. He had not consented to their decision. Indeed, he was from Arimathea, the city of the Jews, 
Uh, who, he, who he himself is also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and then laid it in a tomb that, uh, that was honed out of the rock. There no one had ever been laid before. So we get to meet someone new here. We get to meet someone no, named Joseph of Arimathea. Um, so we know that he's a member of this Jewish council. He's a member of the group that actually had a part in doing and hating Jesus. But Luke here calls him a good and a just man. I made sure I underline that in my Bible so you don't forget how awesome he really is, right? He, he's a great man. He's not, uh, basically, we know, too, that um, he was a wealthy man. He had money. Uh, he, he basically had a lot of money. But at this point, too, was his great reputation uh, with the people and the council. It wasn't just he was just known as a, a great guy on the Jewish council. I mean, everyone knew about him, and everyone had a, he, uh, knew that he had a great reputation. It says in John 19, 38, it says, After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for the fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission, and uh, so he came and took the body of Jesus. So what does this tell us? Not only did he not uh, consent to what they were doing to Jesus, but secretly, Joseph of Arimathea was a disciple of Jesus. But what does it say? He was a disciple in fear. He was in fear of the people that he was around. He was in fear of what could or couldn't happen to him if he spoke up because of how many people hated Jesus. Today, how many of us as disciples are like this? We're men and women who, who are disciples in secret, right? We're influenced and we're scared at the people that, that we are come, uh, come in contact with every day, whether it's at work, whether for some of you it's college, whether it's school or whatever you're from, but we're kind of scared to speak up, you know, like what are they going to say? For you, know, for you, if you're at your job, if someone asks me if, if I'm a Christian or they see me praying at work, what happens if I lose my job? You don't think that Joseph maybe thought about that, right? That, that maybe if he begins to go to Jesus and begin to learn from him and walk, you know, with him, in, 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 that it wasn't in secret, that he might lose his job. But we're going to see something here that comes alive in Joseph. As all the other disciples right now who followed him publicly have left and went home, what is Joseph doing now that Jesus has died? Something was stirred in his heart. Something, something is, is, is moving right now in him. He's going boldly and publicly to show his love for Jesus by asking for the body of Jesus. And he had to put away his doubt. He had to put away his fear of what others might think or what may happen. He knew that this could sacrifice his position. He knew that this could even sacrifice his reputation as being a follower of the Lord. But he boldly takes a stance for Jesus Christ. Think of in our own life. Don't we kind of know that when we begin to share with the Lord that one or two things are going to happen. One, they're either going to, well, actually there's a few things that happen. But one, they're either going to be a believer and they're going to be like, oh, you're a believer too. Awesome. And you guys are going to have a great time. Or two, they're not going to want to hear anything about it. And they're going to look at you differently. I think that's, that's what he was afraid about for a long time. But at this point in his life, he decides to make a bold stand. And it was a stand that he's never going to go back on. We're going to see, well, we won't see any more from him, but he goes out and does amazing things for the Lord from this point on. You know, and I want to encourage you guys today. If you are that secret disciple of the Lord, if you are attending school and work and all these different things, and you're just not saying anything and you're giving no hint that you even love the Lord or any of these things, I just want to encourage you today to have that bold stance for the Lord. Whether it's in schoolwork or just life, in, life period, today is the day that believers start making the stand because the world is getting more and more evil. And like today, this morning, I was talking about Jesus is returning. We are guaranteed that. We don't know when, but we know we're close, right? And every generation seems like they say that it's going to happen with their, with their generation. But as, as it starts growing to the end of time, John warned us that as, as, you know, as, as he's encouraging this church, he's also warning them that there's been many antichrists that are coming. As Jesus gains, gets closer and closer and closer to coming, it's going to start getting more and more dark and more and more evil. And there's no more going to be any more neutral line for you to be on. You're either going to be a Christian and be a hated Christian because I think we're getting to that point now where Christians uh, are speaking love and truth and a lot of people are just hating us for it. 
They don't like to see their sin. They don't like to see that there's something wrong with it. They don't want to hear that they need a savior. And I think that as you guys grow up and as, as I continue to grow and as, as we all get older, that we're going to see Christianity become more and more outlawed, a more and more problem for the world. But I'll tell you something. It says in Luke 12, 8 through 9, this is Jesus, his words in red. It says, also I say to you that whoever confesses me before men, him the son of man will confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And I just want to encourage you guys. Who's more important in your life? Is it the Lord or is it your friends that you're not going to have in a couple years anyways? You know, and I just want to, you know, this is in no way coming at you like, ah, you guys all need to go to church tomorrow or work tomorrow and just scream at the top of your lungs that I'm a Christian. But don't silence what you believe. You know, I mean, I mean, it seems like, too, like we're so afraid to talk about Jesus at work, like somehow we should, you know, I've, I've heard pastors say that, that we need to leave Jesus in the church and at home and not actually bring him to work with us, but we should just be ourselves. It's like, no, you can go ahead and say you're a Christian. If they, fire you, if they fire you for that, they've got a lot of issues and a lot of problems for that anyways. But we believe that God's in control of us completely. So I want to encourage you guys to take that bold stance. But not only did Joseph take a bold stance in the way that he went publicly to ask for Jesus' body, someone that was just beaten and hated and spit on and scourged like no one's ever been beaten in their lives, he goes and asks for the body. But we see also, too, that he gave out of his possessions. He gave to the Lord things that he had owned. His heart was one that was changed, not, uh, not from just being a believer, but one whose heart was changed by the selfless dying of Jesus on the cross. There was something that changed. He was a believer before that point. But after Jesus died, his life became one of worship. His life became one that nothing else mattered. It was only about Jesus. Through his words, through his, uh, his profession, and through his selfless giving, he was living a life of worship. And that's every single one of our hearts. Whatever the, whatever the Lord has given you today, I encourage you to give it back to him. All right? If the Lord gave you a nice house, if the Lord gave you a barbecue, if the Lord gave you a fire pit, whatever the Lord has given you, Lord, how can I use this to glorify you? You've given it to me, and I want to bless people. Man, my house is always, always, always open to people to come over, and that's just because I believe that the Lord has blessed me, even with a home. You know, and, and it's one of those things, too, that as you begin to look at everything that is belonging to God, it's not that hard to give it back to him. You know, um, one thing that I can say is, um, I, one thing I absolutely love about Joseph is that he was a wealthy man, right? It's, it's, it's cool to hear that he's a wealthy man, because I think a lot of times there's a stigma on people that actually have money. They're like, oh, those people are just consumed by their greed and their money, and how could they ever have money, Right? But Joseph did amazing things for the Lord with his money. It's, it's not about how much money you have. It's about in your heart of having the money that you do have. Even serving Jesus with his wealth, his love for Jesus dictated what he was giving. Today, you know, one thing I love is whether we're rich or whether we're poor, we need to see that we need to glorify the Lord in all of our resources in some way. And I don't know what that means, and that's going to look different for me than it is for you and for you than it is for you. It's going to look different for all of us. But we need to look at it as like, Lord, what do you want from me? How can I serve you? I've recognized what you've done for me. I've seen you get beaten. I've seen you die on the cross. And Lord, that has changed my life. How can I live my life as one that worships you? I'll tell you that today, right now in this church, um, we have people in our church that are wealthy. We have people in our church that have money. And let me tell you something. There are certain ministries of our church that could not survive without a wealthy person giving to it. I remember one time we had um, a youth retreat, and I've shared this a few times, but we don't, we don't do scholarships for our summer camp because our summer camp for the youth, like we already do so many scholarships for the winter camp where like I'm getting tired of begging for money for the church, right? Can we have some more money? Like we need more money. And I'm always up here begging for money. And so I just said, I'm not going to do it for the summer camp. If they want to come, that's strictly on them. And um, so someone heard me say that in youth group. I'm like, listen, guys, if you guys want to have summer camp, you guys need to start saving for your money. And someone had heard me say that. And uh, this gentleman came up to me and he said, just want you to know that whatever kid wants to go to summer camp, I'll pay for. I said, that's $200 a child. And he said, so it is. 
So that time of me saying one week that all you guys had to pay for your money to, hey, the flood doors are open. Whoever wants to come, it's been paid for. It changed dramatically from two people to like 35 people by the time it was done. But it was because someone in the church cared enough about these children and had some money to spare that he gave out of his abundance and gave to them. And you know what? That kind of giving is a gift. That kind of give, giving is a gift from the Holy Spirit that whenever, we, whenever someone like that gets it, he gives it out. And they get it and they give it out. And listen, there's so many things our Bible college couldn't stand without, without people pitching in and helping. But let me tell you something. That the amazing thing that our God is and what our God does is he doesn't look at how much money you have. He doesn't care, really, about how much money you have. It's your heart in giving it. Right? If you don't have very, very little, or let's say you have none at all, there's a lot of other things you could give. But if you have very little, I mean, God is so gracious, and God doesn't care that the guy gave thousands of dollars and you could only give 20. It's about the heart. You know, and I think that we get wrapped up a lot of this stuff where it's like, well, if I give my 10%, then I'm, then I'm okay. And it's like, you know what? 10% is a good guide, but... It's up to the Lord and what he calls you to do. And I've shared the story with you many a times, but there's been times in my family where my mom and my dad were called to give their entire wallet and that we had to like raid my sister's piggy bank. And my dad won this, uh, he won this um, drawing at the grocery store that gave him $200 worth of free groceries. And so it's crazy. You know, it's up to us to give to God, whatever the Lord calls us to give. And you know what it's up to him to do? It's up to him to multiply it. And make it go further than it's ever would have gone with just being your $10 or your $20 or your $100 or your $1,000. He will make it go further than it's ever been, than it's ever gone. And in doing so, he's going to richly bless you. I'm not here telling you he's going to richly bless you that if you give a thousand, he's going to give you 10,000 because I'm not one of those people. I'm not one of those people that say, I guarantee you, you take that step and you see what the Lord will do. You give $5, be ready for 50 to be found on the ground somewhere. I'm not going to say that. But what I am going to tell you that God is in complete control of your life. And he sees it, if he sees your heart as one is giving, that's a good spot to be in with the Lord. He will bless you. And a lot of times it is, it is with more money. It is with giving you more money. But a lot of times it's just with other things in your life. I don't believe that a lot of people should be able to afford not to tithe. And listen, I hate tithing messages. Like, I can't stand them. Like, I, I'm very, very hard. I, I have a hard time doing them. And, you know, when some people leave here, they're going to go, well, that was a good message about tithing. Well, so I came for the resurrection, and all I heard was give my money. And listen, that's not my heart at all. But I do believe that we should look at things like this as a man who just ridiculously loves the Lord and he wants to live his heart for worship. And not only is there a profession, but there's also out of his possessions, he wants to give to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7 says, But this I say, that he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Not grudgingly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Just give as God has called you to do. Just 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 give out of your heart. I mean, if that's ten percent, that's ten percent. If that's five percent, that's five percent. If that's more than that, praise God. Whatever the Lord calls you to do, but He's the one that's given it to us all, anyways. The tomb that Joseph would have owned would have been a very, very, very expensive tomb, right? Uh, Basically, these tombs were expensive. They were honed out of rock and. um, and there's a lot of people that could have thought that, hey, you know what? That's a really foolish thing to give to that guy. Why are you giving that much money? Why are you giving that, that chunk of land to Jesus who just died on a cross? Like, don't you want it for yourself? Don't you want to sell it? Don't you want to make money? And I doubt that Joseph ever went there and said, oh, man. Oh, man, I was going to use this thing someday, you know, or I was going to sell it and make some money. It's worth so much money. You know, giving to the Lord to the world is going to make no sense at all. But it shouldn't, it shouldn't make sense to the world because it's something that the Holy Spirit does in our heart. He gave to Jesus because of his love for Jesus. And we're going to see in verse 54, it says, that day, was, that, that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. I know that that's a weird one to talk a lot about, but we're going to talk about that as well. But in most cases, what would happen is they would let the body sit there and rot on the cross right? They wouldn't take them down right away. It was another thing that Rome would do to kind of let you know, like, this is what happens when you mess with us. But they would let the, the, the bodies rot on the cross, or they would allow nature to take its course and let the birds eat it, or like beasts come up and tear them apart. That's like what they would do. But 
you know, I, I think this is crazy too because um, no one argued with him taking Jesus' body. You know what I mean? I mean, these people just got done yelling and screaming and all these different things at Jesus. And you would think that they'd want more humiliation and more things. And you always wonder, like, why they didn't stop someone from taking his body down if that's what they usually did. Well, I think in their own self-righteousness, they're like, oh, we should probably take down these criminals. And we should take down Jesus as well because we can't have them hanging up, up, hanging up there during Passover and during our Sabbath. So let's go ahead and pull them down from there, you know, in their religious, uh, in their religious way of doing things. And Romans would sometimes, they would do that. They would give bodies to the friends and relatives um, for a proper burial. And I think that what was amazing about this is Joseph of Arimathea, when he went and asked for the body, once again, no one argued with him, no one fought with him. And I believe that's because of the reputation that he had. I believe that when he went to, to the soldiers and asked to have, when he went to Pilate and asked for the body, I, I don't believe that uh, Pilate argued with him or anyone argued with him because he had an amazing reputation. And I think that that's a, that's a big deal because I believe that God will use your reputation and redeem it in any way. Well, today, and maybe you're in here and you're like, I have no reputation that you want anything to know about, right? Like, believe me, you don't want my reputation. If you knew my reputation, that's the thing that's causing me most of my problems right now. Well, I promise you, if you surrender that to the Lord, God will use that direct reputation that you hate, redeem it for his good, no matter good or bad. Listen, I've had many friends and people that have come up to me and they're like, man, you don't understand what it's like to be a drug addict. Who are you? You were raised in the church your whole life and you don't understand. That. I don't. But many people I surround myself with have been and have been that spot and they have been freed by Jesus Christ. God will use the fact that you are an ex-drug addict, an ex-alcoholic, an ex-woman beater to the, to the glory of his kingdom. If you surrender it, repent from your sins and follow him. Anything in your life today can be redeemed. And in this case, the, the, the fact that he lived his life of one of a good reputation with people, God redeemed that as well for his glory. And he allowed, uh, he, they allowed Joseph to have the body. So I want to encourage you guys today, never be discouraged of who you are and your reputation you have, because the reputation you have with the Lord is completely, completely different. 55 through 56 says, And the woman who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the, uh, and they have the, as they observed the tomb and his, how his body was laid, then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandments. What an amazing thing. Can you imagine at this point how drained these poor women have to be? We know that a lo- the whole time they're walking around lamenting and, and mourning and crying. The physical and spiritual and emotional drain that these women have to have at this point And I love the fact that you see the commandment of the Sabbath to take it easy one day worked perfectly for them. So they recognize the Sabbath for what it is. They go back and they, and they begin to rest and they begin to have that day, that, that, that rest. And it says in 24, one through three, it says now on the first day of the, of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing uh, the spices, which they had prepared, but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. It says, then they went in and they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So at this point, we know the the women kept the Sabbath. They have a day of just relaxing from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday. And they begin to gather spices and perfumes to to, to bring to the body. He's going to tell us a little bit that Mary, Mary Magdalene, and Joanna were with these women. But what they would do is they would bring spices and they'd bring perfumes for the body. Much like today, we bring what? We bring flowers, right? We bring flowers and other things to show what? Our love and respect for that person that's passed. They were bringing spices and perfumes. Basically, they're bringing the perfume and spices, which would help with the smell. And they would help, it would help prepare the body. And, you know, women are amazing. And let me tell you why. Last week, we talked about how women were amazing because of the compassion that they have built in, right? This compassion that they have. You know, they're always the ones lamenting and mourning. They were never the ones that were spitting in Jesus' face or punching him. I mean, that was never recorded as that. All right, it's never been recorded that a woman was striking Jesus or upset or hitting him or punching him. It was always the one lamenting and mourning what had happened to them. And now we see the compassion that they have, it, it, like the way God has created women, the compassion they have, God creates a boldness in them, right? Think about this. They're returning to, to continue what happened before the Sabbath. 
the, the, the injustice of Jesus, the beatings of Jesus, now he's dead. They watch Jesus be put into the tomb. And now, as soon as they can, right after the Sabbath, what do they do? They go back with signs of love and respect. They go back with these perfumes and these other things. And they go back full on expecting Jesus to be in the tomb dead. Where were the men at? All the men were at home, confused and sad. And the women, where were they at? Continuing to serve Jesus even when they thought he was dead. Continuing to take that chance of serving Jesus and, and being a follower of the Lord and being made fun of and all these different things. The women dug deep and stood bold for the Lord while the men were home, cried, crying and scared that their God, their Jesus had just died. To really love somebody, I mean, if you really love somebody, you want, I mean, you have to be willing to be able to return back to the body, right? Think about that. I mean, it's hard. I mean, in Idaho, it's a huge deal to do open casket funerals, right? I don't know if you guys have ever been to an open casket funerals, but they are crazy. Like, they're huge in Idaho. Everyone has one. Um, I remember when I was a little kid, my first one I ever went to was uh, for my great grandma. She died at like 104. And it's, yeah, it's crazy. Anyways, um, but the minute you walk in, like seriously, I'm a little kid. My dad doesn't realize it's going to be an open casket because, I mean, she was really old to begin with. So the, you walk in, though, and the first thing I see is this dead body. And I'm a little guy, and I'm just like, like, does anyone see this dead body here? Like, there's a dead body in the room with us, right? And my dad began to explain to me, like, she's not here. She's with Jesus. And I'm just like, no, she's here. Like... <laughs> She's really here. She's right in front of me. And my dad's like, are you doing okay? I'm like, yeah, no, it's good. Just saw a shell of a woman. It's wonderful. Thank you. You know, I'm telling you, man, I love my dad. I love my dad, but they had an open casket for my dad's funeral. My grandma really wanted it. Man, that's hard to, to, to go back and revisit that person as being dead. That person is no longer being here. And I don't understand why people do it. I mean, maybe you're a huge advocate of it. Like, oh, open casket funerals. I don't get it. But to see them as, as what they once were, and these ladies are going with full expectation to prepare the body of Jesus, even knowing he's going to be dead for a day now, a couple days, a few days. He stinketh, you know? And they're going back to, to, to take care of Jesus. Listen, my... my, um, my um, my wife's mom, she had an open casket funeral as well. And, uh, yeah, man, like I said, they're, they're creepy and they're weird. And um, they, they put all this makeup on and all this stuff. Like, you have to have, like, a picture. And they're, like, they try to make it look like they did in life. And they did the same with my dad. And, and you know, they put, like, coloring. I'm sorry, I'm getting kind of morbid. But they put, like, coloring in your body to where your skin's the color that you want it to be and all these things. And, and they were going to, they asked Audrey, they said, you know, what do you want the makeup for your mom to look like? And Audrey kind of, like, you know, I never really thought of that question. And she begins to show him a picture, and she didn't like the way it looked. And she said, would you care if I did it? And the lady's like, are you serious? And Audrey's like, Yeah. So her and her cousin went in there, and just to do one last thing for, for her mom, the one last day she could serve her mom, she puts on the makeup of her, of her deceased mother in, in the coffin, showed up early, made her look beautiful, and it's just like, man, women can dig deep. They have this compassion, and they have this love that, that is, is hard to explain. As I'm having a hard time looking at the person I loved more than anything, my father, my wife's over there doing her mom's makeup. It's just something women have. They can dig deep, and this compassion drives them to serve. So here you have these ladies. These ladies that were in Passover. I mean, these ladies that, had, that were at Sabbath and taking it easy, and now they're not done serving the Lord. They go get their perfumes. They go get their spices, and they're going to return to see Jesus' dead body. It says in verse 4, and it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. So they go back, they don't see Jesus, they see these two men in shining garments. And then as their face were afraid and they bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee saying, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. 
And they remembered his words and they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the 11 and to all the rest. Man, they go back to return to one to find, to, to, to expecting to find Jesus dead. And they see that the, the, the stone has been rolled away. This stone would be massive. Okay, and it takes, it takes Roman soldiers to pull this thing over and so you can get into it. But they show up expecting with all their little perfumes and spices to they walk up there and the stone is gone. Stone is rolled away. It would sit in a track and they would actually have to roll it away so all the animals and stuff couldn't get it. They'd have to roll it on top. And basically at this point, at this point they don't see uh, Jesus in there. They don't see anything, but they see two men in shining clothes. Basically, um, the NIV, I love what it says. It says, two men that shined like lightning. Um, can you imagine showing up to want to see Jesus? And instead, there are these two guys with like a dazzling... Yeah, I kind of understand being a little bit perplexed, right? I got a horrible, horrible picture of this, and this is going to be a stupid reference. And I know right now I shouldn't say it, but I'm going to. I'm going full force. Twilight, Okay. <laughs> Right? When, when uh, what's his name, Colin? When, or what, he, he's sitting there and he's like, you know, he goes out in the sun, he begins to sparkle. He looks bedazzled. Like, that's kind of what I'm picturing. These people shine like lightning. They were sparkling. And basically at this point, I love the question they ask as these people show up. They, I mean, the ladies are perplexed and afraid and the angels are like, why do you seek the living amongst the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. And so the angels are basically asking, do you not remember that he said to you, uh, he said numerous times that he was going to be crucified, but don't worry, he's going to raise again. You know what that tells us? That tells us the angels are watching. The angels were watching Jesus, and he, they were listening to what he was saying as he begins to talk about his victory that he is going to have. And so he begins to tell the ladies, they tell the ladies, do you not remember? And how amazing is it, like this video said, that this, um, this announcement that was made about Jesus' resurrection, this was made to women. All right? And women were looked down upon during this culture. He, he talked about it up there as well. But you know what else sounds kind of crazy? Is his resurrection was, was mentioned to a bunch of people that were looked down upon. But who was uh, his, his birth? That was mentioned to a whole bunch of people that were insignificant. It was announced first to, to the shepherds, right? God is moving and working in people that seem like they're insignificant to the rest of the world. And God is alive and well and working in their hearts. It doesn't matter your status. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your friends think about you. God is alive and he's working in your hearts. And he loves working through people that no one else expects them to do anything. Why would you be here? Because Jesus is alive. And I love that the women are looking perplexed at them, right? And I told you that the women have a reason to look perplexed because they're shining like lightning and, they're, and they expect to see a dead Jesus. But the angels are just as perplexed at these women coming to find Jesus dead. Right? Do you guys see how crazy this is? They're freaking out, and these angels are going, what are you guys doing? I'm perplexed just as much as you are seeing me, that you came here to see Jesus dead. He told you he wasn't going to be dead. But today, how often when we seek Jesus, we seek Jesus as one who is dead. When we seek Jesus, we seek Jesus. It's a very small Jesus that's still in the grave. That is not our Jesus. Our Jesus is not living in amongst the dead. Jesus is amongst the living, moving in our hearts and changing lives. Man, I encourage you guys, when you guys seek the Lord, to seek him like he is alive and well. That he's alive in your hearts. Not just saying like, Lord, thank you for raising from the dead. But when you talk to him as one who is listening to you, as one who loves you, as one that wants to have a relationship with you. And let me ask you a question. Whenever you have an issue in your life, and this is going to sound like some name and claim it theology, but it's not. Listen, as you have issues and problems in your life, what do you speak into them? Do you speak doubt? Do you speak confusion? Do you speak chaos? I could never. The Lord's never ever going to or how how could this happen to me do you speak that into your life or do you speak an alive Jesus into every situation of your life Lord I don't understand but you do and I'm going to follow you because you are alive you no longer in the grave sometimes times can be hard and I'm telling you Satan would like nothing more than you to speak negativity instead of an alive Jesus into your life 
Many people or even believers approach him as if he is still dead and he has no communication or, or no desire to be intimate with you, to know you intimately, to know everything about you. In Revelations 1, 17, 18, I love this. It says that when I saw him, I fell at his feet as I was dead, as dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys to Hades and to death. That's the Jesus that you serve. I was dead, but now I am alive and I hold the keys to Hades and death and I will be alive forevermore. Romans 6, 3 to 12 says, or do you not know that as many of us that were baptized into Christ Jesus were also baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in that newness of life. For if we had been united together in the likeness of his death, which we were, certainly we will also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died once and for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We have that freedom now in the same way that we, we uh, identify with our sins being crucified on the cross. That Jesus took them. We need to identify with the newness of Jesus as well. That he has been raised and you are no longer that person that you were. Last week, if there's any of you that were uh, here, I know that there was, uh, just from people that were coming forward, quite, quite a few people that gave their hearts to the Lord. They were talking and crying, and other people that came, and, and they had been walking away from the Lord for a long time, and they say that they want to turn back, and they want to continue to give their heart to the Lord. Listen, let me tell you something. If you were at that message, the one where Jesus died, and you, and you, and you recognized with that, and, and it brought you to tears, and it brought you to, to sadness, and all these things, and you realize that how wicked your sin is, well then today, let this message be the one that drives you with joy and happiness, that you are no longer that person, but you are a resurrection, you are completely different, you are new, you have been changed. In Colossians 3, 1 through 4, it says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things of this earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who appear and in our life appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. And like I said, we're going to end there as far as the the uh, message goes. But I want to encourage you guys as the worship team comes back up here. Jesus' resurrection is very, 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 very important. And it is the reason, and it is, it's what makes the good news, the, the, the gospel, which means the good news, it is what makes the good news good, is that Jesus didn't stay dead. There is now hope for us as believers. Jesus, our King, our God has conquered the grave. And once that we were dead in sin, we are now alive in the same way that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He is alive. He is moving. He is working. Serve God knowing that he is working in your life. Even if things, even if things seem crazy. Now, I encourage you. We do the prayer every time. Guys over here, girls over here, me and all my wife are up here. Pray to a real, alive God who knows you, who loves you, who wants to spend time with you, and loves you so much that he died and rose again and conquered death for you. Man, I am, this message is, it's cut out to be the most encouraging message of all time. And if you came in here heavy hearted, congratulations, you don't have to leave that way. Get your heart right with the Lord and walk out of here knowing that you're a new person today. God is so, so, so good and gracious. His mercy is so, he has so much mercy for you. In the same way that the women went to go find a dead Jesus and the angels were just as perplexed at looking at these women 
you know, they're, they're, the women are terrified of these men and they're perplexed on what's happening. These angels are perplexed at why they're going to look for a dead Jesus. And I encourage you tonight to not go looking for a dead Jesus. You pray to a God that is listening to you right now that understands your situation better than you do, that has a plan at the end for you. He sees the ending. He sees what he's making in you. If your life is hard right now, say, Lord, what are you doing? Don't speak there, what is happening, how is anything going on, but give it to the Lord. The Lord knows what he's doing in your life better than you do. The Lord will receive glory. And like I said a little bit earlier, that Your reputation of who you've been up until this point, God will redeem it if you want him to. Whether that's one of always being a moral person or whether that's one of always following the Lord or one of these different things, you can say, Lord, just use my life completely for your glory. Redeem my life. And if that's one of being an ex-drug addict or a drug addict right now, say, Lord, I need to be freed from this. I need, I need you to completely take over and I need to be crucified with you, but I also need to be raised again in you. So Lord Jesus, come. He's come to set the captives free. He holds all the keys.